I'd like to welcome you all for uh, joining us. Uh, already quite a few of us on this uh, on the Zoom meeting. This is, um, before we start in terms of the substance, um, I just want to say a few things about this initiative. This Foreign Policy Talks is a new initiative that uh, the CIS together with um, UIC Panorama, the International, uh, International Council, the, International Relations Council of Turkey, led by Mustafa Aydin, we decided to, to work together to start this new series. And I, I guess inspired by COVID and all of us working at home, this has become a means of, of communication. Um, so, um, so this is sort of an attempt, and then we, Mustafa and I talked about uh, what should be our first topic, and we thought that, that this is a, a topic we need to discuss. And that's why we're starting with Greek-Turkish relations. Next week, we'll be dealing with the Black Sea. We'll, I'll talk about it at the end. Um, so, uh, welcome to this uh, meeting. Uh, Mustafa Aydin, you want to say something about this new project that uh, we've launched? Um, thank you, Dimitri. Let me welcome everybody also on behalf of uh, International Relations Council of Turkey. Uh, Panorama is a new publication. Um, it's about, it's, we started in January, mid January. So, it's, it's, it's as, as old as COVID. Uh, 19 threads. Uh, the aim was to reach general public uh, with uh, academic background uh, and short accessible uh, analysis. And then we are expanding now um, with uh, short uh, videos, um, uh, interviews, uh, etc. And when Dimitris came to me and told, you know, suggested we should start something. Uh, the, the result was foreign policy talk series, and this is of course the first one we had to we had to start with Turkish Greek relations as the first uh, in the series. Um, so let me not take too long uh, and welcome you all again to this new series, Dimitri. Yes, uh, thank you, um, thank you, Mustafa. All right. Um, now, this is, um, I, I, we have four speakers with us. We have four speakers with us. Um, uh, all of them are very qualified and very knowledgeable about the issue. Uh, Mustafa Aydin, who is the president of the International Relations Council of Turkey and a colleague of mine uh, at Kadir Has University in the Department of International Relations. Um, and, and someone who has been a long time involved in uh, Greek-Turkish issues. In fact, he and Kosas Ifandis, uh, uh, were uh, had the first Greek joint Greek Turkish academic collaboration when they co wrote a book in 2004 on Greek Turkish relations, an edited volume. Um, and, and so, uh, and, and we more recently, Mustafa Aydin is uh, like myself, uh, Solio Zell, and uh, more even more recently, Panayotis Trakonas. So we are all members of the Greek Turkish Forum, and Mustafa Aydin is also the, the Turkish coordinator. Of, of the Greek Turkish Forum, the two coordinators there. Um, and the Greek Turkish Forum is a one and a half track initiative where Greeks and Turks and, and Cypriots, uh, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots interact periodically to, to try to address our issues. Our next speaker is Kosas Ifandis, who I mentioned, uh, who is a professor of international relations at Antion University. Uh, until very recently, uh, he was also a colleague of ours at Kadir Has University, where he had a, he had a double appointment with his university in Athens and, and Kadir Has University, but he decided to leave us and stay, uh, stay uh, in Athens. Uh, another colleague with a long-standing um, involvement in uh, Greek-Turkish issues, as I mentioned, he has co-written the book with uh, Mustafa. Kosas and I have also worked recently on many issues, in particular uh, on uh, foreign policy elite surveys, Greek foreign policy elite and Turkish foreign policy elites, trying to assess how they view each other. Um, also with us is uh, Sol Yozel, uh, who is also a colleague at Kadir Has University, but uh, Sol is also currently a visiting fellow at the Institut Montaigne uh, in Paris, uh, a former Bosch uh, fellow, uh, a columnist uh, in many, many outlets uh, here in Turkey. Uh, someone who, uh, Sol Yozel is uh, my oldest Turkish friend. Uh, I met him before I met Mustafa, and I think the two of them are the oldest Turkish colleagues and friends that I know. Sol even remembers that when we first met in Bosnia, you told me, Tuzla, right? It was. I had forgotten that, but you reminded me. Uh, long time ago. And um, 
we worked together over the past uh, when I was uh, a fellow at the AU Institute for Security Studies in Paris. Uh, Soli, Soli was a visiting fellow for a couple of months. And obviously, he's been involved in this issue as well. Uh, he's not a very active member of the forum, but nevertheless, uh, it's always great to have him on board and uh, hear his two cents. And, and the last speaker is Panayotis Tsakonas, who, uh, who uh, is a professor uh, of international relations at the University of Athens and a senior fellow at the Elia Met, the Hellenic Foundation for European Foreign Policy, in charge of its uh, program on Turkey, on contemporary Turkey. Um, Panagiotis and I also know each other from a long way back. Before I moved to Turkey in 2010, we were colleagues in the Department of Mediterranean Studies uh, at the University of the Aegean in Rhodes uh, and for, for about four years or so. And, and, and uh, Panayotis has also been very much involved in uh, Greek-Turkish relations uh, and actually has written a number of books. And, and, and one of the books that's uh, marked sort of the field is um, it's called The Incomplete Breakthrough in Greek-Turkish Relations, Grasping Greece's Socialization Strategy, published in 2010, which was even nominated for an uh, Edmund Keeley Book Prize. Uh, but uh, he's also been relatively involved in this topic throughout his career. And most of us here also um, have also have a lot of policy experience. And it's not just academic, but we've also been involved in our, uh, you know, foreign ministries, foreign ministers and defense ministries and other state structures. And, and so this would make for a very, very interesting topic. Now, uh, before we go, uh, the idea is if you have any questions to ask, uh, you can put them in the chat and I'll try to see uh, which ones are bundled them together and we'll see which ones that we can ask we can ask to the speakers. Uh, we're going to have about uh, three rounds of uh, questions. I've, I've asked, I have told the speakers, well, they will make brief interventions and let's see what comes out of it and generate a discussion. Now, I want to say that one would expect that this is a normal thing to do, given the circumstances and the times that Greeks and Turks, academics get together and talk. It's not that easy anymore. Even though I am an academic, a Greek academic in a Turkish university for the last 10 years, uh, given the level of tension, and I'm speaking a lot uh, from a Greek perspective, from, an, uh, from Athens perspective, uh, it's very difficult uh, to actually get Greeks and Turks to talk. We have uh, monologues on, uh, in Greece and maybe in Turkey about this, but Greeks and Turks to talk openly to an audience uh, is uh, something that uh, is rare and, and is a very in a marked contrast to I remember the second time I came to Turkey 2003 I was at the time working at the EU Institute for Security Studies in Paris and um, a, a Spanish colleague and I were invited for a German Marshall Fund event here in um, Istanbul and my colleague Martin comes to my office in Paris and he tells me this is 2003 Dimitri, Dimitri, do I need a visa to go to, do we need a visa to go to Turkey? I said, well, I don't need one, but you should check. And Martin's reaction was, ah, if you don't need one, I don't need one. You, you as a Greek, I said, it doesn't work like this, Martin. Martin never checked. He says, you're always joking, so we don't need a visa. So we land at Atatürk airport, from, you know, fly in from Paris. We go through passport control. I let Martin go in first. And, and he goes to give his passport and he's told, go there to the right somewhere and get a visa. Martin is shocked. I said, don't worry, Martin, I'll wait for you here. So Martin go gets his visa, he comes back. We go through passport control, and as we get out of passport control, there are these pillars, and in one of the pillars right in front of us is a huge banner, and the banner has a Greek and Turkish flag. This was the time that Greece and Turkey were bidding together for the European Football Championship. We never got it. I think it was the 2008 football, European Football Championship. But for Martin, who had just gone through the shock of him needing a visa and me not needing a visa, the fact that he saw a banner with a Turkish flag with a joint bid, he was shocked. And he turns to me and he goes, you guys, meaning you Greeks and Turks, have been joking to us all these years. And I go, no, Martin, just because our relations are tense does not mean we don't talk to each other. But... And the only reason I'm saying this, and this has been a long time, it's almost been 20 years. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is that it's almost come to the point where we don't necessarily talk to each other uh, as much as we did. And I think this is something to consider as we get into this discussion. Now, um, and, and the question is, therefore, does each side understand the other? 
uh, does each side understand the other? It's also something key to this. And whether we are talking to each other, trying to understand each other with tools of the past, and maybe things have changed or they haven't. So I would like to start a round of discussion uh, on basically a question or a series of questions on what is the state uh, of uh, Greek-Turkish relations today? Or what, uh, what do you think are the key issues? Um, or, and what are the key challenges encompassing the relationship? And maybe I'll start with Mustafa uh, and then move on to the other speakers. So Mustafa. Um, thank you, Dimitri. Um, thank you also for reminding us that uh, we co-edited with Costas a book all, all those years ago. Uh, the book was, uh, subtitle of the book was Escaping the Security Dilemma in the Asia. Uh, and uh, it's almost now 18 years, and if you start counting the, from the rapprochement, it's 20 years. Uh, what happened in those 20 years is the problems that we identified at the time and many other people identified at the time, which I would call them old problems or traditional problems on Turkish-Greek relations, they have not been solved uh, with the process of rapprochement or negotiations, proximity talks, uh, and, and etc. But they have managed somehow. Uh, they have not flared up since the rapprochement started, uh, and we have not yet uh, come to another position where uh, the two navies and two air forces and the soldiers on both sides of the Aegean are not posing towards each other uh, with, with menace. Uh, so this is a kind of a gives us a period of managed but not solved, uh, 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 problems are not solved but conclusively uh, we are where we are today. Uh, however, the old problems or the traditional problems of Turkish relations, they are there, not solved, uh, but they are on the background now. They are not, they are not what they used to be. Uh, the problems of minorities, problems of the Asian uh, territorial sea, uh, air uh, flying, uh, tour lines, and etc. They are all still there, but Somehow the urgency is not there. However, we have new problems now, uh, or at least maybe let's call them new challenges instead of problems. Uh, and you know, chief among them, of course, that they differ from the perspective of Greek and Turkish uh, perspectives. If you look from Greek perspective, it might be different, and from Turkish perspective, it might be different. But I'll try to uh, list some of the um, challenges that I see, which I think is a challenge for both sides. The first is, is the refugees. Uh, this is a, uh, it's a different kind of problem for two countries. Uh, it's different uh, well, how we understand this as a problem in Turkey, and it's different how the Greeks understand that in, in Greece. But nevertheless, uh, it is a problem and it's a challenge that we have to manage. Uh, it's, it's there, it's not solved. Uh, urgency is maybe not there just before the COVID-19 crisis. There was a, quite a bit of urgency, but now it's not there anymore. But nevertheless, the problem is not solved and it's there. Uh, the second, of course, it's something it's growing. Uh, what I would call East Med or Eastern Mediterranean problem. And this is wider than Cyprus problem, the traditional Cyprus problem. Uh, it, of course, involved the Cyprus problem, and, uh, and because of it, it's more complicated, uh, but it's not only Cyprus. Now it's growing, and, they, and new sites are joining, uh, and it's becoming uh, something very complicated. Mustafa, uh, include the Mustafa, Cyprus problem. Mustafa, include, sorry. Mustafa, somebody's microphone must be open. We can't, I can't understand what you're saying. There is a static, there is a noise behind. I, I personally cannot hear you. Okay. Could we ask everybody to close their microphones? Yeah. I think it's now closed, right? Um, okay. So the second problem is this Mediterranean, and we might go into the detail. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, But the problem with this is it started to impacting the Asian issues as well. Uh, because of what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean and increasing tension there, 
some of the older type of problems are uh, uh, re resurfacing. Uh, we are getting a statement. And they started to kind of tickling the old problems uh, again. Uh, the problems that haven't heard in last five years, maybe last 10 years, uh, suddenly appeared on the agenda. Uh, the third problem or challenge is, is an old challenge, of course, but it's renewed version. It's Cyprus. Uh, somehow, many people are now feeling that are we at the end of the road in Cyprus? one way or another. Uh, the, the, the feeling of despair is quite increasing, on, both on the island and outside the island, who are among the people who are studying the issue. Uh, and maybe we need something else, a new agenda, a new uh, direction in Cyprus. Otherwise, it's kind of, uh, it becomes unsoluble. Uh, then um, there is this, over enveloping all these challenges is the challenge of Turkey's relations with or Turkey's non-relations with European Union. Uh, because let's remind us that uh, the rapprochement process uh, was uh, anchored in a late, it, it didn't start it with the European Union connection, but it was in later years, it was anchored in Turkey's negotiations with the European Union. So now that's ended. There is no such an anchor anymore, uh, and the challenge is how to ch how to uh, rephrase uh, or reframe Greek-Turkish relations without the European Union input. Uh, and maybe one final issue that the current challenge, uh, uh, which might not be seen as a challenge in Greece, and I know it doesn't seem as a challenge, uh, but it is it's seen as a big challenge from the Turkish uh, policymakers and the decision makers, it's the, the Fethullah Gülen group members in, in Greece. Uh, we are getting, it's not, I'm not talking about the soldiers who, uh, who seek refuge in Greece. This is much beyond that. Uh, and there are a number of figures are going around and they are increasing. Uh, and the parallels are being drawn with uh, what happened in 1980s uh, with the left wing uh, uh, Turkish uh, politi uh, political refugees, or in 1990s, what happened with the Kurds or PKK related Kurds, and etc. Now it seems that Fethullah Gülen related people are flocking uh, into into Greece. This is uh, this is a problem seen from the decision makers' eyes, uh, not not much in the public eye in Turkey. So let me stop uh, having listed all these problems or the challenges. Uh, let me stop here and then we can maybe talk about how we can going to solve all this. Thank you, Mustafa. I mean, I think you've raised a number of issues which uh, from a Greek perspective uh, are, could be debated and debatable. Um, even the, the even the fact that uh, problems uh, emerges uh, in the plural and uh, and I think some of the things also detaching the EU Turkey relationship from Greek Turkish relations is very interesting uh, and obviously this is not what uh, Athens necessarily wants but I would like to give the floor now to to Panayotis Tsakonas uh, maybe to to hear his insight again we're talking about the same question about uh, the current state of Greek Turkish relations the key issues and the challenges. So, uh, Panayoti, Taki, please go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Ah. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, I uh, I would propose to think in um, in, in terms of Greek Turkish relations in the context of a, of a pen and see how uh, uh, relations have been evolved uh, since the the seventies. Um, so as to get an idea about where we, we have been and where we are, we now stand, and how things have, have been developed. Uh, so, in in case you think uh, Greek Turkish relations in the in the in the, you visualize within the, that uh, uh, pendulum with uh, um, the center at the center having a uh, stable uh, Greek Turkish relations, while at the left end. You have uh, you are moving uh, towards um, 
less stable relations or hot incidents or even crisis. Uh, you see that most, most of the time, um, Greek-Turkish relations over the years, uh, uh, the, the pendulum moves from, uh, from the center or stable or less stable relations to um, uh, either hot incidents or crisis with very few parentheses in between of, uh, of uh, really, really stable relations. I, one might recall at this point the crisis that have erupted in the 70s, again in the 80s, and, and again in the, in the, 90, in the 90s. Um, however, since, since the late 90s, the pendulum uh, seems, seems to uh, be starting moving towards the right, uh, I mean, uh, literally and metaphorically. Uh, and uh, and uh, it almost touched upon uh, the the right uh, end, uh, where the the two states uh, came clo uh, quite close to the to the resolution of uh, of their conflict. Um, of course, um, this was due to uh, Turkey's interest to come closer to uh, the European Union. The shift in Greece's policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, supported uh, Turkey's candidacy. Uh, then, after that, I would say, a uh, brief period of, um, uh, you may call it the Helsinki days, uh, th that followed the EU Helsinki decisions in 1999, uh, Greek Turkish relations have again started uh, deteriorating as the freezing of Turkey's uh, accession process uh, sometime at around 2006 led to a growing interest in Turkey to follow a more uh, uh, independent, I would say, less EU uh, and more ambitious uh, Middle East uh, oriented and, and I would call it a security-based uh, rather than interest-based foreign policy. So, um, and that is the view that, that comes from most policymakers and, and security analysts in Greece. Uh, over the, the last uh, uh, five years or, or so, uh, especially after the, the, the failed military coup in 2016 and the presidential elections in 2018, uh, it seems that the, the, the so-called new Turkey has adopted a, a more assertive uh, foreign policy, which have been illustrated by certain actions, uh, military interventions or challenges, uh, even to the legal order of the, of the Eastern Mediterranean. So, Turkey has abandoned, uh, as I said, the security-based foreign policy with certain ambitions vis-a-vis -vis its periphery and move further down uh, the path. I would call it a, a, a more uh, power-based foreign policy that exhibits the same pattern uh, of, of assertive behavior in Cyprus, uh, in the Aegean, and in Libya as well, as meaning in in certain parts of the Middle East and North Africa region, which in turn uh, means, and I think that uh, adds up to what uh, Mustafa has already said, uh, uh, it, it means that uh, the range of the Greek-Turkish conflict uh, has been broadened as well, uh, with the old conflictual issues, namely the uh, over the Aegean Sea, over the, the, the Cyprus, uh, have now been linked uh, with new conflicts in the Middle East uh, and North Africa region, in Libya by all means, and to a certain extent in, in Syria. So we are now standing, I would say, in a, at a very um, risky and, and fragile state of relations. It seems that the pendulum has again moved from the less stable re relations further left to uh, or closer to um, a situation which is indeed uh, risky and, and, and fragile, uh, given that, uh, that these developments that are, are taking place uh, were uh, witnessing, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, in that broader region of the Greek -Turk Turkish conflict, also il illustrate um, the, the propensity that, that serious tensions could arise around Cyprus. Uh, that could in turn reignite also uh, dormant with Turkish relations over the delineation of, uh, particularly over the delineation of, of, uh, of the maritime zones.
you should turn your microphone on. I did. Uh, so yes, uh, thank you very much, Taki. You've taken a, a much, long, much long-term approach, a different approach than what uh, Mustafa has raised, and I think it's very interesting to see it that way, and it's also very telling, therefore, from, a, from a conventional wisdom in Athens of how, uh, what the, the complexities and the dilemmas are in terms of Greek-Turkish relations today. Um, I'll now give the floor to, to, to Soli, uh, to again, it's the same question, the same debate we're talking about the current state of relations and the challenges. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I don't have to add or repeat what Mustafa has said or what uh, Professor Sarkonas has said about the outstanding issues. What I'd like to do is perhaps raise questions and actually mention two dimensions which I think are effective in making me maybe a bit more sanguine than the previous two speakers. Uh, I really find certainly on the Turkish side no urgency, but that has always been the case since I first got involved in Turkish-Greek relations back in 1996. Turkey has a much bigger basket of foreign and security affairs uh, menu than does Greece, I think. And uh, in terms of the public here, apart from outbursts like we should change Lausanne or you know, sending the refugees, creating an unnecessary crisis, uh, all the rumors about Turkish soldiers having crossed the border and, the, and Greece is building fences and whatever, I really don't feel, and perhaps because I am removed from Ankara, I really don't feel that kind of an urgency Eastern Mediterranean is a different matter. That's number one. Now, it strikes me as not insignificant, but maybe not as maybe too important, that today the Turkish airline, the, the Minister of Transportation announces that Turkey has actually made deals with 40 countries to start uh, Turkish airline flights again on the 10th of June. Greece is one of those countries. Uh, secondly, the, the, uh, the kind of human interaction did not exist despite the fact that there was no visa requirement for Greeks uh, in 1996 that there is today. And I doubt that the islands that are close to Turkish coast can actually prosper without their Turkish clients with a lot of people also residing in some of those islands. Um, I think those tensions are going to be there. It's going to be a matter of whether or not we can manage them. Today, what I think is very different is the following. Greece is no longer a significant political actor within the EU. Turkey does no longer have any realistic hopes of joining the EU, although the president reiterated on the 9th of May that Turkey's ultimate goal is to become a member of the European Union. And in fact, he said, he used the word, our Europe. It does not really um, correspond to our realities here. Uh, and I think the European Union, which was along with NATO, and I think NATO is far more important in actually calming the waters down back in 1996 after the, I'm sorry, 97 after the uh, Imya Kardak crisis. Uh, the U European Union played a constructive role. I really doubt that the European Union is a constructive institution when it comes to management of Turkish-Greek relations. Uh, partially because the European Union does not have a unified strategic uh, view, vision, or policy. Uh, and, and partially because I find, quite frankly, the efforts to use legalisms, not necessarily legality, to deny Turkey 
what in any international relations course would actually be granted to her in terms of having interests that are legitimate to which or against which a combination of countries are actually constantly making moves. The 11th of May joint declaration which the Israelis did not participate um, the fact that the European Union has, to my reading, uh, violated its own um, bylaws and accepted a divided country as a member, which country has then become a big pain in Turkish uh, EU relations, sometimes uh, an excuse, sometimes a real thing. And the fact that on Cyprus, until the gas issue came about, nobody really took the issue seriously because in all that period, since 1974, not very many people died, but a total of four, you could just get by. And suddenly, the uh, energy sources and their, how, how to share them or not to share them had become an important matter. So I think, the moment the European Union acquires a policy vis-a-vis -vis Turkey that deals with it, not transactionally, but strategically, the moment, and I may be prejudiced still, but that the Greek Cypriots recognize that they really cannot have a wrestling match with Turkey, some of the problems that have been with us since the 1970s have continued to linger on, but I don't think we would have any need to be as preoccupied or as uh, anxious about a flaring up of uh, more uh, conflict between Turkey and Greece. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Soli. Again, I, your intervention also raises a number of questions in my mind that I'd like that give the speakers um, the role of uh, commenting and answering. So um, next is Costas. Uh, again, same questions. You've also heard in this first round some of the perspectives um, from your, our colleagues. So let's hear what uh, you have to say. Thank you very well, much, uh, Dimitri. <clears throat> okay, when I'm done with my five, six, seven, eight minute remarks. <laughs> uh, people, uh, you know, our audience, I think, will be amazed on, on how much we see eye to eye, at least us five, uh, on, you know, our assessment of uh, the state of play, the state of affairs uh, in, in the, uh, between Greece uh, and Turkey. Okay, first of all, thank, thank you very much, you and Mustafa for taking the trouble to organize this discussion. Uh, and I agree that uh, uh, it is not easy. We don't talk uh, as people uh, would expect. Uh, and I think we don't talk because there is very little to say. Uh, as Mustafa said, 2004, we wrote, we co-edited a book. Most of the contributions uh, are still very much relevant both in terms of analysis and uh, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, explaining uh, things. Um, the one caveat before I proceed that, uh, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, if there are, uh, by the way, it's, it's almost a family event. Huh? Most of the people attending are good friends. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, if there are any, Firebrands in the audience. Um, let me uh, let me indicate that I'm not here to to fight the good fight, uh, you know, uh, or or any fight for that uh, for that matter. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, to 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 confess that uh, I cannot recall, as I said the last time. Uh, we felt the need to assess the current state of play in Greek-Turkish relations. Um, with Mustafa, it was 20 years ago, 21 years ago, when, when he had, uh, set up a uh, uh, one-day conference uh, in uh, 
at the main amphitheater of Ankara University. And it was a full house and it was a fired up audience because it was the day after the, the, our regular Turkish, uh, Greek Turkish um, uh, crisis rendezvous after the Ocalan uh, affair. Since then, we had lived through a period of relative calm. Tensions were kept at bay. Uh, the official discourse until very recently was one of, of embracing, you know, engagement, a conditional engagement, a procedural rather than sub substantive effort to address the long-standing issues uh, was made and bilateral relations flourished at many levels. The volume of trade grew manifold. Uh, we witnessed the, the gradual formation of, 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 of constituencies in, uh, in both sides of the Aegean that somehow refused to, to, to view um, the, 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 the social and societal interactions as extraordinary, which was the case before in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s. And, and, and overall, a cultural and economic and social context, context manifested itself in a variety of, of, um, of practical ways. By all means, we have to admit that in the last 20 years, a positive, a key, was accumulated. Uh, and a key, however, that we failed to capitalize on. Uh, why? Because of domestic constraints and political and economic developments in both countries. The very real security issues were never dealt with. In Greece, it was uh, very early, the, the, the debt crisis that destabilized the political system uh, and, and allowed uh, a very toxic uh, form of populism to rise and take over the politics of the country. And in Turkey, the, uh, the, the need to consolidate power at home by AKP and, and uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, and to project the influence um, eastwards sort of carried the day. Eventually, whatever momentum was there fell to, uh, victim to, to a number of, of negative domestic and structural dynamics. Uh, let me list some of them. The, the a cul-de-sac in, in Turkey's European vocation, a primordial public discourse in, uh, in Greece with, uh, with, uh, with political forces conducting, conducting um, uh, uh, politics with a very strong Greek civil war flavor and, refer and nationalistic, ultra-nationalistic preferences. You know, remember the government, the coalition government between Syriza and, and the independent uh, Greeks. And th that, that, uh, that setting, you know, endangered the, the, the post Kunda um, political consensus in Greece. Another development that uh, uh, became an obstacle was a profound stalling of the democratic process in Turkey. Both before and after the, uh, the, uh, the criminal attempted coup of the summer of uh, 2006. And this was coupled with a, with a, with a nationalistic turn uh, of the government, of the uh, governing elites, maybe out of, of, of necessity, or it seems uh, uh, that way. Um, also, we had a total collapse of the security landscape in the Middle East that affected Turkey's security concerns. Uh, we had, of course, the latest uh, failure to resolve the Cyprus issue, and as Soli mentioned, the discovery, discovery of energy resources in Eastern Med, which in the case of Greek-Turkish relations, turned out to be a curse rather than uh, a, a blessing. 
uh, and I think I will stop here. I think I will. This is this is how I think the the the, the landscape is is um, can be mapped out. Thank you, thank you, Costas, uh, for for your uh, expose. And again, you've raised questions. Uh, I mean, that that give a lot of food for thought. I'm also saying that uh, we are, uh, you guys have been giving longer uh, explanations, exposés. So what I will do is, because the second question I was planning to ask you, you've sort of addressed it already, where relations are today and why they are where they are today. And I think uh, many of you went through a sort of a historical analysis which explains many things. And how do we move beyond? So let, let me go basically to the third one. How do we move forward? Given this context, can we move forward? To some sort of mutually acceptable relationship. Uh, what kind of relationship? The status quo as it is today. The status quo ante, which is maybe what today is without a lot of the uncertainty that has arisen over the last few years since and we, from what I've heard from all of you, uh, 2015, 2016 seem to be sort of a, a change. Uh, or do we need to move beyond to some concrete resolution? And is that possible at all. Today, um, in the Greek press in Tanea, uh, Thanos Dokos, the, uh, the Deputy National Security Advisor, who is an old friend of ours here as well, he wrote a very interesting piece and, and with a title which had a question mark, and then let me translate it. He said, is there, is a change in framework possible for Greek-Turkish relations, right? Uh, and, and I think, and of course, he was addressing in the piece a Greek audience because there's a big debate generated in Greece about the state of relations. But it was very interesting in the way Thanos tried to raise this. And I think this is what the question is. And maybe we'll go very quickly again in order, maybe with Mustafa, to see how do we move ahead and what does moving ahead actually mean? What sort of relationship given the circumstances? Um, thank you, Dimitri. I, let me uh, start. Uh, the second round of questions that you actually didn't ask, but I'll frame my answer within within that as well. Uh, I'll, I'll start with something Soli said, and which is important. That it was in one of my notes here. I think we have one of the challenges that we are facing to, today. The two countries, and especially the civil societies in two countries, have become complacent. I mean, this is not uh, only because, from the Turkish perspective, of course, we are. Uh, not as much interested in, in Greek-Turkish relations because we have uh, so many other issues, but nevertheless, uh, even the people who are interested in Greek-Turkish relations are very complacent because of uh, kind of a managed situation that I already indicated in my first intervention. Uh, whenever there is no, since there is no uh, urgency of crisis, the people who should be interested in dealing with this issue uh, do not have the urgency of dealing with it. So we, 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 we let it go. Uh, you know, it, it takes place in, as, if, as if in a vacuum. Uh, it takes in its own life. The rapprochement is not anymore tended either by the Turkish state or by the Greek state or even by Greek and Turkish uh, civil society. I remember the, the day, early days of the rapprochement when there was a, uh, a number of meetings between two sides, uh, the civil societies, uh, individuals, academics, diplomats, uh, several meetings, and everybody was searching way of going forward, uh, a searching way to solve of the problems. But now, uh, even the proximity talks finished after, I don't know, I think 63 rounds. So this is one of the problems that, and when we are looking for the future to move forward, this is something that we have to address. We have to find new ways of talking to each other. Uh, and this has to involve, and I said this somewhere else, uh, kind of a fact checking and fact correcting. Uh, both societies are quite well known of exaggeration of the issues that they care. Uh, and this is especially true for the presses on both sides. And since somebody that I, I follow on both sides, press and media in general and social media also, uh, I see that there is so much of fake 
information, fake news, uh, crisis-ridden uh, analysis, and etc. And this has to be con countered. Uh, and this cannot be countered by the state themselves. Uh, this has to be come from the civil society and some sort of a countering this negative narrative has to come. And we, we have to come up with some sort of a new narrative for Greek-Turkish relations. The second problem and the solution that we have to find is th there was this some sort of an unrealistic expectation of decoupling of Greek-Turkish relations. I always found it as a uh, unrealistic, and I think the history of last 20 years, and especially the recent years uh, or recent months, have proven me correct that we cannot really decouple Cyprus from Greek-Turkish relations because one of them always keep poisoning, poisoning the other one. So uh, my suggestion here has always been a grand bargaining. Whether that's possible or not, uh, the other way, it didn't work. I mean, you know, the 63 rounds of proximity talks about the agency have managed to contain the problems but it has not managed to solve the problem. So we, maybe we have to widen the uh, 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 framework of the negotiation. Uh, we have to maybe widen and change the issues that we are discussing and come up with out of the box uh, discussions and solutions. Uh, and finally, uh, I think we need uh, some sort of a new beginning, a new commitment. Uh, Talking about the rapprochement process after 20 years is not an uh, ideal situation. And it's not correspond to the reality. And, you know, rapprochement cannot continue 20 years. It happened, it finished. Uh, the political situation in both countries changed. Politicians on both countries changed. Even the diplomats who initiated the process has changed. The academics got old. We have new generations of researchers, diplomats, and politicians, and we have new generation of problems and challenges. So if we are to continue to deal with each other, we have to start restart maybe a new round of rapprochement uh, and with, you know, in tandem with the new reality. Uh, how are we going to do that? Well, we'll discuss. Let me stop here. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mustafa. Um, thank you for raising this point. You know, it is very interesting, especially your point. And I think you are, uh, the, the point you talked about, um, new ways of talking to each other and fact-checking and fact-correcting is something that we experience together, I think. Uh, you know, one of the things that I do is a Greek-Turkish Young Leader Symposium every year, and the last one was in December in Kavala, where 15 young uh, leaders from Greece and Turkey and 15 from Turkey met. And apart from, we talked to them with about relations, bilateral relations, and they worked together on common project ideas. and of the three project ideas that were presented by mixed groups of Greeks and Turks, fact checking kept coming up and fact correcting. And that was very inspiring. Uh, that was something very inspiring because we never led them onto this. But this is, and these are very mixed groups also representing different perspectives on Greek-Turkish relations in either country. And, and very recently, again, about a month ago, uh, because this was a really good meeting, uh, I, I dubbed it the spirit of Kavala and we had a, a Zoom meeting of the group again. Uh, at a time where there's even more tension between the two. And this theme came up again from the, the participants that were given the floor, the young Greeks and the Turks. So that's interesting, it's something maybe we should listen to because it's also linked to the next generation we need to, generations we need to focus on. So um, let me now uh, give the floor to, to Panayotis Sakonas. Again, uh, same sort of questions and framework. Um, right. right, well. Um, let me start by uh, from uh, your last remark about the role of the youth and, and the civil society in general and touch upon some of the remarks made by Mustafa also. Um, I think we should have in mind, we should take into consideration we are, we are now living in a totally different universe than the one we've been living in uh, in 2000. Uh, 2000 from 2000 to 2004, or about that uh, that time, uh, of the of the um, experiencing the the positive effects of rapprochement and so on and so so forth, uh, meaning that at the time there have been some good reasons 
and some good um, uh, factors for uh, for the civil society and the youth, along with other um, societal factors, to be um, uh, empowered by the process that have taken place, and especially by the uh, uh, by the by the prospects of, of Turkey becoming a member of the European Union, uh, which is not the case uh, anymore. So uh, we have to uh, take into account to what extent and how much those domestic actors uh, can be empowered by, um, you know, um, a strong, let's say, uh, prospect, um, which uh, I, I cannot really see at, at, at the moment. Um, number two, um, I think uh, we have to, uh, going, straight to your to your question about the um, what uh, uh, how we can how we can move forward uh, uh, I think the uh, history of Greek Turkish relations uh, suggests that uh, a kind of a stepwise uh, process should be followed uh, for relations at least to come back to uh, to uh, the state of uh, stable relations where issues, uh, of course, of high politics and their differences will remain un un unresolved and, and probably parallel monologues will, will take place. Uh, yet the two states can have a, a sincere and sincere uh, uh, dialogue uh, over a number of issues. So uh, I doubt that we can, in a way, jump to any kind of uh, uh, resolution to the, to the conflict. Um, so, Within that stepwise process, I would put forward, first of all, as things stand now, what is important is, I think, to develop uh, channels, uh, which I doubt uh, uh, they, uh, uh, which I doubt are there, uh, that would, uh, I would say, opt for uh, um, the easing of tensions. Uh, and most of all, managed to make clear that uh, a hot incident or a war in the Aegean would be uh, a detriment to both sides, that there would be no gains for any, any party. And that in turn means that, uh, that Turkey should put aside uh, any policies of, I would call them myopic optimization, meaning short-term uh, gains to, to uh, certain actions, uh, developing, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. I think much will depend on the Erdogan's decisions and, uh, and policies. And I think so far uh, he has proved, uh, has proved himself to be pragmatic and, and decide to even make U-turns. Uh, the example of Russia is the first that comes to my mind. Yet, I would say under uh, the conditions that such terms will, will entail, uh, uh, will not a day, uh, a devolution of, of power, a share, a share of power, a sharing of power. Which, my, which brings me to my second point uh, that would, uh, I think, have positive effects uh, and, and lead to better with Turkish relations. Although I, one should, by all means, uh, take into consideration some of the uh, uh, arguments uh, highlighted by, uh, by Solirizal. Um, I think of a, of, a, of, a, of a kind of a new deal, I would say. Um, Greece actually uh, should opt for in being concluded between uh, the EU and Turkey. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, uh, you had managed to do a lot so far in, uh, in the past, especially in the past towards conflict resolution, while it now looks it can do uh, little even with regard to conflict management of, of conflict uh, uh, prevention. However, I think there is, uh, there is still some leverage, especially uh, due to Turkey's dire economic um, uh, situation that might allow for a new deal that would uh, uh, manage to address uh, uh, certain issues uh, certain thorn, thorny issues like the migration challenge, along, I would say, with uh, um, the, a new updated uh, customs union uh, between the EU and Turkey. 
And to my mind, uh, all three uh, parties in Greece seem uh, to agree on a kind of a transnational logic with regard to uh, the commencement of negotiations between the European Union and Turkey for a modernization of the customs union. And, and they also seem to appear uh, receptive to sound out the possibility um, uh, of an upgrade to customs union, provided, of course, that certain conditions, uh, political conditions, could be, could be also attached to it, like, uh, for example, the um, uh, which are important to Greece, notably uh, issues related to security or to defense or, or to, to migration. And, and last, uh, uh, I'd like to, um, to highlight the issue of, um, um, of the difficulty uh, of, the, of the Greek politicians to, uh, to make hard decisions uh, by referring most of the time to the fact that they can hardly overlook the Greek public's negative perception uh, or perceptions of, of Turkey. And um, I would like at this point to, um, uh, to raise, uh, to draw your attention to um, um, uh, a public opinion research which has been conducted uh, uh, sometime in, in, in late uh, uh, 2019 which revealed that although the absolute majority of the Greek public uh, uh, considers that Turkey is a great grave threat to, uh, to, to Greece's uh, security, uh, around 90%, or 89%, uh, at the same time, uh, that uh, the electorate's perception uh, and feelings with regard to uh, Greece's stance towards future relations with Turkey uh, are positive by being in favor at around almost 70%, 67% of a pragmatist, of the need of a pragmatist approach that promotes uh, um, bilateral dialogue with Turkey as well as, as further anchoring Turkey uh, in the EU. A particular prerequisite is in it uh, for uh, this um, uh, policy being adopted and being um, developed by Greece, uh, apart from easing of political relations, as I mentioned, and to a certain extent, this, the cessation of, of Turkey's assertive policy in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, I think the, the, the big, biggest obstacle, the, the main problem has to do with for better relations uh, uh, or to any agreement between Greece and Turkey is Turkey's recognition of, of the Republic of Cyprus. I'll stop at this point. Uh, we are starting to run over, but we'll, we'll continue for about 15 minutes. Uh, give uh, both Soli and Costas a chance to say a couple of things and also then maybe take a couple of questions. But let me just say, uh, because it's interesting uh, when it comes to youth and uh, Taki, you were talking about what motivated groups, civil society groups, uh, when the accession process was on, and there's nothing here now. I disagree with you. I think there is. Because you refer to public opinion poll. Mustafa does a lot of these also. And it's very interesting that even though, and we heard from some of the comments, there's a negative attitude vis-a-vis -vis the EU. The last public opinion poll that Mustafa did about Turkish civil society, there is a majoritarian trend uh, in favor of the EU accession process. And, and the reason this is, I would say, is it has to do with the issue of democratization and democracy. It has to do with that. Because when we talk about customs union, well, I've heard a lot of Turks also say, well, let's there include norms and values because this helps us. And likewise, I think Costas raised the point too about the division that existed in Greece, the polarization, and, and the threat of populism itself, which is not a thing that comes and goes, it, it's gone. It's, it's there in the background. And should relations deteriorate, this would create, I think, the conditions in Greece for non-dialogue. And I think this is a motivating factor somehow. This is what I see from the youth that we work with, that on both sides understand this somehow, even if it's subconsciously. And, and the need, therefore, to create maybe a new... Uh, uh, um, framework for, for dialogue. Anyway, this is just a point from what you said. 
Soli, um, your turn. I find myself in. I, yeah, yeah. I find myself in the unusual position of sounding hawkish. I really think Turkey recognizing the Republic of Cyprus is a non-starter. We shouldn't even talk about it. On the other hand, uh, we have to. We have. I concur with Mustafa that we should have a much broader perspective and try to see if we can actually change it. And that's. I also agree with Thomas Dokos's title that we need to think of a new framework within which to actually push or bring uh, Turkish-Greek relations forward. Uh, I think there are two problems and I, I, we have to think about how to overcome them. One, as in other places, frozen conflicts at one point become unfrozen and can become threatening and that's what's happening around Cyprus. Secondly, I think part of the changing landscape in our bilateral relations is the fact that Turkey's other problematic relations in the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean have also inserted themselves in Turkish-Greek relations. And already our relations are pretty complicated, bring in the Egyptians, the Israelis, and everybody else, plus put, pour the energy on it, uh, then we have, we have a mess. First of all, maybe it would be very helpful to all parties to be slightly realistic. The gas in Eastern Mediterranean, all of it, that is Egypt, Lebanon, Israel, Cyprus, is 3% of the world supply. Demand in Europe, which where this gas is supposed to be destined for, is not going to be increasing in leaps and bounds. The uh, pipeline, EastMed pipeline, I understand that other people call it pipe dream, is too expensive to bear the current energy circumstances and it will take quite a while. There are all, there are in my judgment, all the ingredients to actually come together and create a mutually beneficial plan through which this energy can actually be exported to whichever markets it's going to be targeted to. For that, the Cyprus issue will have to be resolved one way or another. It will not start by Turkey's recognition. Uh, a two-state solution probably is not an option either, reasonably. Uh, but I, I personally, I, I, don't, I don't accept the fact that the, the Greek Cypriots who reneged on their promise on the Anand plan in 2004 should have a right to constantly block everything. And my concern here is not Turkey's strategic interest, my concern is the Turkish Cypriots' interest. We'll have to find a way of bringing the island into the European Union with a formulation that we really haven't talked about. Once that is gone, and I really do think that Cyprus is the big poison well in Turkish-Greek relations, once we can solve this, if it can be solved, then we can move forward. I really don't see the Aegean problems to the extent that I've studied them. The Greek-Turkish Forum wrote a very early letter on that, uh, on that issue. They are not unresolvable problems. The moment the Cyprus issue is taken out of the way and trust can be reestablished between, between our two countries. I find the Eastern Mediterranean potentially a new economic zone in which Turkey and Greece can actually do a lot and the Israelis will also have an interest in being engaged in. But that really requires that we first of all stop getting too excited and start talking with one another and that is what is missing. I understand the concerns and they are reasonable concerns, they are legitimate concerns that Turkey's bluster in the, in the past few years scares everyone. It's a, it, it is pursuing a very, aggressive for, a very aggressive foreign policy. But again, think of it from Turkey's perspective on two grounds, the coup and the failure of the European Union members in standing by Turkey during that coup, including the United States. And secondly, the attempt to use the sea of, uh, law of the sea convention 
to tell Turkey that it really does not have anything to say upon where, how much it can uh, expand its uh, interests in, in, in the Mediterranean. These are not really simply legal issues. Thirdly, maybe that may play a role, not with the, with the Trump administration, but with another alternative administration, that uh, the uh, love affair between Turkey and Russia seems to be cooling. The love affair between Turkey and the United States seems to be warming. And uh, to the extent that the Americans will care again about Europeans, the transatlantic alliance and NATO as an institution, which is probably likely if a non-Trump becomes the president of the United States, maybe as if, as if it were in Madrid, we can actually uh, find an institution within which we can, we can move forward. Uh, but let's try to dissociate first Turkey's problems with the Middle Eastern countries from the bilateral issues that have been with us for such a long time. Unmute. Okay. Well, thank you, Stoli. Um, I, I, I wish I could have a debate with, uh, we need to move on uh, to, um, to Costas. Um, again, uh, it's the same setting. How do we move okay. forward? We've been having a very interesting debate. Uh, and um, let's hear your thoughts, Costa. Very quickly also, because we... Very, very yeah. quickly. How do we move forward? Forward from where we are, currently now okay and now uh, we have an agenda that is crowded uh, with with, um, uh, with with the ever divisive security worries in both sides uh, of uh, of the Aegean. the positions are uh, maximalist uh, the context is zero sum we are in a in a in a, in a, in a situation of standing our ground again or rather we have never moved away from it so i'm afraid you know within this context we've, we've we have run out of ideas to my mind europe as a framework uh, that can satisfy um, turkey's preferences you know is is bankrupt for for the time being so we, there is nothing at least to my mind, uh, we can expect uh, uh, from uh, from Europe. Uh, Europe as a facilitator uh, ran out of steam a long time ago. Um, there, at the same time, there is no effective constituency that can offer something that Turkey finds attractive. There is no one capable of of altering. I think right now. The, the, the strategic calculus in um, in, uh, in Ankara, uh, uh, and uh, there is nothing that can. Uh, I mean, I cannot see anything that can uh, can change uh, Greece's perception that Turkey is a revisionist and opportunistic uh, player. So uh, I'm afraid, unless something dramatically positive happens, that we are looking. Uh, a period of uh, of uh, not protracted conflict, but certainly protracted protracted uh, uh, high level tension. But this time, this time, I think there is, for reasons that I explained uh, earlier, uh, there is a higher risk of of the whole situation degenerating dangerously close to. To a tag, not a tag of war, but a tag of violence uh, scenario. Given the perception also uh, in Turkey of a very favorable balance of uh, of hard power, at least in some circles in, in Turkey. Uh, so, the, uh, talking about security dilemma that we discussed with uh, Mustafa 20 years ago, the danger of a spiral is uh, is uh, ever present. Uh, what I would like to see, but this is more and I, I admit that I acknowledge that it is utopian but I would like to see a bold move of let's say a commitment um, to, to resolve disputes um, uh, by non-violent means remember we have not done this okay, so a declaration of principles even today that we you know the fault lines are are, are intact um, uh, 
uh, and then maybe we should start you know a serious brainstorming on, on, on and find a process that will allow very bold and very daring ideas to be discussed okay uh, a sort of sort of uh, uh, oslo process okay I, and i know i know i know that um, that the actual oslo process uh, collapsed or failed soon after uh, after the official signing but let's let's prove that uh, we can do uh, better thank you dimitri Thank you, thank you. We're, we're running out of time, uh, but also looking as you guys were talking to some of the questions, um, which we're not going to answer them all, but I think it's very interesting. Uh, first of all, I'm more convinced now because Mustafa and I have been talking about writing something and maybe even a book, and I think I'm more convinced after this discussion of the need to do this um, and we've exchanged messages recently about moving forward. Um, because there's a lot out here and I think the value added of what we have done, maybe we do not get into details, but we've also maintained, which is a thing that's missing, our training as political scientists and IR scholars and trying to understand the real issues and dealing with the issues. Because a lot of time the debate, especially the one that I follow in Greece, it's about, it's reactionary as opposed to really understanding what motivates, what is it that um, each side uh, is concerned with. Uh, now, some, some of the things is, I, I especially like some of the things that Costas talks about, uh, maybe, maybe it's true, uh, a, uh, a declaration of principle about the non-use of violence might be interesting. Uh, one of the comments that has come in uh, from, from a, a retired Turkish ambassador is the need, uh, who disagrees with the fact that Cyprus is more important. Uh, he suggests that actually the bilateral issues are more technical and more, uh, important and maybe there's a need to stress the revitalization of, uh, of the exploratory talks and uh, but this brings in another issue because we did not talk about it because it also has to do with um, the administrative changes uh, in Turkey proper after the referendum which has also created some issues not only in terms of Greek Turkish relations but in terms of Turkey's relations with other partners as well uh, and so institutions like the foreign ministry might not be uh, what it, they once were, and this also creates some sort of, of issue out there. Some of the comments have also come in regarding, uh, I, from Turkish participants, uh, observers, about uh, w reflecting some of the things that we heard that uh, the EU might not necessarily be, uh, it's not objective enough. On the other hand, my point would be that um, I'm more convinced, if and after this discussion, that Greece has no choice but uh, to use the EU leader. Uh, under current situations and, and use the EU lever because it's, it's, it's a fallback from um, the accession process with its norms and its values and the framework that was there. And if that accession process is not there, then maybe what Panagiotis Sakon has talked about is what we go towards. And it's, it's a discussion that some have been talking about, a big deal, a big package, which includes many issues, but there is a framework there which allows us to operate within. And I think this is probably the only plausible, uh, um, realistic uh, thing that we could aim for right now. And I think both sides need this. Uh, but, um, but I think there's a lot of food for thought here. Uh, uh, I wish we had more time to, to deal with issues at, uh, in depth. Um, I wanted to say that uh, Mustafa and I have talked about this in the sense that uh, we plan to, uh, first of all, we're continuing this series. Next week, actually, it's going to be a, a discussion on Black Sea security. We will promote it starting tomorrow with experts from the Black Sea region. But we will come back to Greek-Turkish relations, uh, maybe in a format like this, uh, maybe in a format where some of our speakers are uh, people uh, in the media on both sides uh, and, and other actors also to hear their perspectives. Uh, but, I, but I think also given the interest and how many people actually signed in and actually uh, followed us, um, we need to uh, continue this. Uh, I also have some of our Cypriot colleagues um, want to talk about Cyprus. So Cyprus is also something that uh, will be part of our later discussions. Uh, I have promised our colleagues in Cyprus, especially colleagues in the Greek Turkish forum that uh, we will be having a debate about Cyprus and how it all fits in. So I'm coming back very quickly to the speakers. Do you have anything to add, comment on what your colleagues have said? 
uh, uh, otherwise we'll be taking this to a close. So Mustafa, Costas, Panayotis, uh, uh, Soli. No, okay. I do, I well, do. Then. Ah, you do, okay, sorry. Go uh, ahead, Soli. Again, it's against my nature to be optimistic in relative terms, but I cannot arrive to, to share Costas' pessimism about a period of long protracted, but where will it come from? Where will it, where will it erupt? Why would it erupt? Costa, you want to say very quickly? Perimene, perimene. Go, uh, okay. go ahead. Okay. Uh, I remember we had the same discussion uh, in Oxford a few years ago when uh, my dear Soli accused me of being, you know, a degenerate realist. <laughs> anyway, yeah. That was 10 years ago. <laughs> was it? <laughs> so, uh, okay, what I said protracted high level tension. Okay, so I think we, we have all the ingredients of, of, of you know, of, of, uh, of um, moving, unfortunately, uh, toward uh, this uh, situation, unless something, something uh, happens that turns the table. Um, okay, um, Europe is not there, United States is not there, Turkey is engaged in two military campaigns, okay, uh, uh, in, 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 in Syria and in, uh, uh, and, in, uh, and in Libya. In Greece, in Greece, because of, uh, uh, as I said, the, the, the legacy, uh, the legacy of, uh, of what happens uh, in, since uh, I would say 2015, and uh, and a nationalist uh, turn, uh, the, uh, as I said, there is no, I cannot see uh, a majoritarian constituencies that can drive the process, a, a positive process uh, between the two um, uh, right now. So, in terms of what divides. Uh, the two countries, the gap uh, is still there, and we we uh, uh, we started looking at it again. Uh, uh, so the, the fault lines are are intact. Issues that have been deemed strategic, okay, because either they are linked to critical national security uh, or national interest, critical national interest, or they are linked to to national prestige, okay, or they are perceived as as sovereignty bound, okay, uh, are one more once more at at forefront. Okay? The, as I said, the agenda is crowded with with uh, 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 with a very malign. Uh, 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 there is no good faith anymore. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know. I, as I, I tried to explain it in my opening remarks, why you know, domestic and regional structural um, influences. Uh, Dimitris, may, may I add something on that? Uh, sure. Because I very much align to what, uh, to what Costa said. Then actually, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of things being developing the other way forward. Actually asking an optimist, what are the, the good reasons for being a feeling optimist. There's an old uh, phrase saying uh, an optimist is a, a less informed pessimist. Okay, okay. Mustafa, you want to say something also? Very well, I mean, you, you gathered all the realists here uh, you, and you cannot get alternative view. I would say in the longer run, the realist view is never failed. So let's let's add a little bit more realism in Greek Turkish relations. Um, actually, Soli touched up on there uh, briefly when he was talking about Cyprus and Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, you know, we, we always come across both in Turkey and in Greece, and also 
much more in a much more abandoned way in Cyprus uh, of un, unrealistic expectations. And this is not something new. You know, the history of Greek-Turkish relations since 1950s is about unrealistic expectations of both sides. Uh, and on top of it, Cyprus came. Um, so uh, dealing with reality is something, if we can uh, enforce this and if we can entice both uh, uh, populations in both countries, then this is a success. Then the success story or a new kind of a story can develop from that uh, emergence or from that uh, reality check. So let me stop here. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for a very, very interesting and rich discussion uh, and uh, our audience uh, for sticking with us. And uh, I look forward to, to uh, having more of these and hopefully have these in person as well. We need also our physical contact, which we've missed uh, all these months <laughs> in isolation, quarantine and whatever else. Thank you again. Thank you again for uh, taking part in this. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you.